Kate Coulter. Um, I'm up in the Phoenix area. I'm actually a landscape architect uh, and I've been involved with uh, Watershed Management Group uh, on and off, well, pretty on and off here for um, several years. I took the, I'm plugging my computer in here. Sorry, I just noticed that it's not plugged in. So that would be a problem. Um, anyway, I've been involved with WMG for um, quite a while. I took the um, water harvesting training in 2012. And uh, so kind of been involved ever since then. So um, we'll get started here. Hopefully there will be some time at the end for questions and um, we'll try and ask some questions throughout too to get you guys um, thinking and make sure you're, you're with me. So let's see, I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Okay, so hopefully we can all see that. Hydrate your plants. That's our presentation tonight. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with just kind of an overview of how the presentation is going to go. So um, these are the, the top things that I think that you'll need um, in order to be a plant pro and start designing your yard or whatever space you're working with. Um, so we're going to talk about the benefits of native plants. Um, we'll talk about planning your space. So how do you, you know, start looking at what space you're working with and then strategies you might use to select plants in that space. And then we'll actually go through, you know, a big chunk of the presentation. We'll be going through some select plants that I think are, you know, important plants for um, landscape in the Phoenix area. Um, and then I'll give you a few additional resources because there's just going to be a ton of information and um, you're going to want to look it back up later on. So we'll give you some resources for that as well. All right, so the first thing I start off with is talking about what is native and what exactly do we mean by native plants? Um, because native really just means a plant or animal that is um, kind of evolved in a certain area over a certain period of time. So that can actually be pretty vague description. <laughs> and, you know, if we considered Arizona, the whole state as that region, then some of those plants actually, you know, that grow in Flagstaff probably aren't going to do very well in the Phoenix area. So, um, so what's more appropriate for this um, uh, application is to use a definition of native that encompasses the Phoenix area ecosystem. And so Phoenix um, is part of the um, Sonoran Desert. And the Sonoran Desert actually has several different um, smaller subsections in it. And so I love this map. I wish it were in color. It would be easier to see, but I've only found the black and white version. But you'll see that there's kind of two um, uh, regions that are encompassed in the Phoenix Valley area. And that includes the lower Colorado River Valley and the Arizona upland areas. And so I'm going to be talking about plants that are native to these two subregions of the Sonoran Desert. Uh, this, the lower Colorado River Valley uh, tends to have this kind of um, creosote flat, more open area. It's kind of what you'd see driving out to Maricopa. And then the Arizona upland areas are what we tend to see more in our mountainous areas. Um, you know, up at the superstitions, and that's where you start to see the cacti and saguaros and things that are kind of typical um, when you think of the Arizona desert. <clears throat> so I also want to just briefly touch on why we're, why I'm focusing on native plants, why the, the presentation is going to start there. And um, I just think that this really connects to, if you were in the presentation last week when Ryan went over um, some of the principles of water harvesting. I think this really ties in with strategy number four, start small, start with small and simple strategies. Um, and the reason this fits in is because native plants are already evolved to survive in this environment. So by starting with native plants and starting with those as part of your space, uh, you get to start simple and you're not trying to find plants that are going to work or you're not having to you know, baby plants that are really not made for this environment, um, it's really going to make selecting plants a little bit more foolproof for you if you start with native varieties. It's not that I have anything against non-native plants and if you have stuff in your yard and you want to incorporate it, I think that's great. 
Um, it's just that's not, you know, what we're going to focus on today. So, um, so here's some more just if I haven't you yet about what, um, why native plants are so great. Um, so one thing is you're going to be using less irrigation, right? Native plants are evolved to uh, the rainfall amounts that we typically see here and also to the timing that we typically see those rain events. So, um, so that's a great starting point. There are plants, you know, that maybe if they're kind of typical to a um, riparian area or somewhere where there's usually water, they might be a little bit more water intensive, but generally they're going to do great. And um, you'll also see too that native plants are really responsive to, you know, what, how much water they're given. So I like to show this one with the creosote because it's such a stark example. But this is uh, on the left is a creosote at the Desert Botanical Garden that is, you know, not on irrigation. It's just left to, you know, it's not in a basin. It's not getting any extra water. Um, and you can see it's a huge plant, you know, it's, it's five, six feet, but um, it is a little bit more sparse, you know, it's not putting on a ton of um, uh, foliage, it's not looking super, super green, but it's surviving, it's doing great, and, you know, even when it rains, it probably will look a little bit more lush. And then you'll see the one on the right, this is one that's on an irrigation system. So you can actually do the creosote either way, if you have no irrigation, you'll be fine. If you do have irrigation, you know, that'll work too, and you'll actually get, you know, a little bit of different look um from the creosote when you do that or you know from most native plants all right so one of the other things you get less of is less maintenance so provided that you have um, thought about the full size of the plant that you're selecting and the location where it's going uh you really shouldn't have to do too much maintenance to that plant most uh, native plants horticulturally do not need a lot of maintenance, um, especially shrubs. If you're using cacti, agaves, um, things like that, they're really hands off plants, especially if you've got them in the right place. Uh, I like to show this picture. This is um, a uh, Texas sage. And these are the ones you usually see all over town that are, you know, trimmed up into a little hockey puck or a ball or, you know, some abnormal, <laughs> non-natural shape. And this is a picture of it with its natural habit. So this one hasn't been pruned. And you'll see it's pretty big, but as long as you've given it a lot of space, so it's not growing into a pathway or something like that, where it's creating a hazard, you can let it go and it will have this really great habit and shape to it. Um, it will actually, most plants will actually flower more <laughs> if you're not pruning them that way, over pruning them. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things you can also do to control this and to control the maintenance is, you know, controlling how much irrigation is being put on your plants. So like I showed the creosote on the previous slide, um, you know, all that extra water is creating extra growth. So if you actually design your landscape so that it is running off of rainfall alone or surviving off of rainfall alone, you're going to reduce your maintenance um, needs as well. Uh, and then if you want to take it one step further, <laughs> um, you can also start to just, you know, when debris, um, leaves, flowers, seed pods, things like that, that fall from your plants. Um, if you choose to leave those things and, and let them um, stay in place, they can turn into mulch. And so this is great because it holds moisture in the soil. It gets broken down by soil uh, microorganisms and actually becomes more nutrient. Uh, create, gives more nutrients to the plant itself. So um, if you resist that urge to rake out everything underneath your um, plants um, and do less maintenance, you'll actually see better results uh, for the health of your plants. And then um, another thing native plants need less of is less fertilizer. And so I like to think of this as, you know, the native plants, they they're not as finicky and they don't need as many touches on them. And, and the fertilizer is one of those things. So uh, if you're using native plants, fertilizing does not necessarily need to be part of your regular maintenance routine. Uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, these plants are generally adapted uh, to our soil conditions. And so, um, you know, one thing that our soils, one example of that is our soils tend to be low in nitrogen. 
And uh, so there's actually a lot of our native plants that have adapted solutions for this problem. So many of our native trees are in the um, family Fabiaceae, uh, which is the pea family. And uh, plants in this family have a unique adaption that allows them to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and turn it into a type that's available to the plant in the soil. So, uh, so native plants actually, you know, have some of these built in mechanisms that allow them to thrive and create the conditions that they need in order to thrive um, here in the desert without a lot of our own input into that process. And then there's something with native plants that you actually get more of. So um, one of the great things that comes along with native plants is creating more habitat. And I don't necessarily mean um, rabbits or snakes or things that like might actually some people have a negative con connotation to. Um, but even just thinking habitat down to the level of our native insects and bugs, because these are so important to the food chain, right? Um, especially you know, birds and nesting season, really require insects uh, because they have such a high level of protein, they need these to feed their young. So uh, insects are a really important part of that, that food chain and that process. And uh, insects are actually really tied to native plants. So um, there's been a lot more research recently, um, Bringing Nature Home, this book um, I've got here by um, Douglas Tallamy is a really great example of that. But he's finding that uh, there are a lot of specialist bug species that can only eat native plants. They're, they're not adapted to eating exotic plant species. And so when those plants aren't available in the landscape for them to eat, um, they actually are losing a food source and losing the ability to survive uh, even in their native regions. So it's really important that you know, we provide native plants when we can because they can provide that resource for, um, for insects. There's a lot of um, different information out there if you're really interested in creating habitat in your yard. Uh, there's some more aspects to it. Um, the uh, National Wildlife Foundation has a program where you can uh, follow their principles, which include providing food, water, cover, places to raise young, things like that. Um, and then you can get a cool plaque that you can display in your yard that shows that your yard is uh, a wildlife ha habitat. So that's kind of neat. Um, and then the city of Glendale also has a really great resource they've put together that's available on their website uh, that is specific to, to Arizona. So that's a great resource if you're interested in it um, as well. So I like to uh, show this picture because uh, this is a native plant. This is a native mesquite tree. And I like to show it because it kind of encapsulates all those things that I was talking about that so about native plants. So um, this is a native tree. It's not being provided with uh, irrigation. Uh, its taproot is well established. So it's soaking up water from um, well, uh, well uh, into the soil. And they're not having to provide anything additional to it, uh, which also helps moderate the growth a bit. Um, and creates more sturdy wood for the tree. Uh, and you'll see there's too much um, broken, broken uh, branches and things like that, damage like that. They're not fertilizing this tree. They're definitely not fertilizing it. It is growing fine on its own and quite big already. So they probably don't need to add anything to that. Uh, and you'll also see they're following some of those uh, uh, maintenance techniques. So they're actually leaving the debris that falls from the tree on the ground. Nobody is raking the, the leaves up and things like that, uh, which helps improve the soil over time and also helps retain moisture in the soil. So that's another reason why this plant doesn't need irrigation. They're also, um, this is another thing, they're reduced, the, they have um, used a program of reduced pruning. So this tree is not somewhere where it's growing over a uh, sidewalk and hazard with a light. Uh, and so that allows them to let the tree have its natural habit. You'll see that it, it um, extends basically all the way to the ground and creates this really great canopy. Um, and, and creating that shade and that canopy is another way that you can hold moisture in the soil. So uh, that's another reason that this tree is surviving really well without irrigation. And then you'll notice it's habitat. So <laughs> 
Um, so there's a little lizard hanging out under here, but really that, that canopy creates this really great environment for um, all kinds of things to crawl in there. And you can even see in this picture some of the mulch and debris and stuff that's being left um, on the ground. And so all of that is helping to create uh, an environment um, that allows the plants to thrive and allows um, animals and, uh, and birds and insects to thrive as well. All right, so hopefully you're on board. I've convinced you native plants are great. Um, and so what I like to do now is just talk a little bit about um, your spaces, uh, the, maybe you're working on a yard or something like that, um, and how we start to you know, get oriented to our space and start thinking about what plants are gonna fit into that space. And we'll have a few opportunities to kind of chime in with the chat feature um, and, uh, and we'll see how that works. But <clears throat> there should have been a, a handout for this. And so if you're starting to think about your space, um, that might be a good time to pull that out if you've got it with you. So the first thing um, you know, to start with is understanding your space. Maybe this is a yard that you're working with. And there's some questions that you, you know, you're gonna wanna ask yourself. And really what we're trying to figure out is kind of what the physical environment is like and also, you know, what are kind of the climato climatological, what are the, kind of the features uh, that, of this yard that are gonna kind of make constraints or opportunities for you? Um, so, you know, what does the existing yard look like? You're gonna have to start creating a site plan. So that's kind of your basic layout. You know, is there a house, a driveway, a walkway, patio, where are all those things? Uh, located. And so those are kind of the existing features that are on the ground. Um, you'll also need to think about existing features that are underground. So you can call blue stake. And I know Ryan mentioned this uh, in his previous, uh, pre in the presentation from last week. Um, but blue stake or Arizona 811 will mark out um, certain utilities within your yard. And, you know, it's important to know these because a, if you start digging, you don't want to accidentally hit something. Um, but it's also good to know because you don't necessarily want to plant a tree or something um, that could possibly have large roots or invasive roots over, say, a water line or a gas line or something like that. And it could create problems as you go, you know, throughout the year. So something to definitely be aware of. Um, and then starting to think about, um, do you have any current grading or drainage concerns? Uh, if you have areas that are ponding or flooding, uh, you know, you can start to think about your earthworks and how that might be incorporated. Uh, but you might also be, that might also be a clue to you that maybe you have a certain soil um, condition. Maybe there's an area of a lot of clay. Um, or maybe you have an area with caliche or something um, like hard pan where water is not able to drain. And so all those things you'll want to know before you start putting plants there, because if you put something that really can't tolerate having its roots wet, then it could create a problem for you down the line. Uh, and so uh, are there, so we're also thinking about, you know, exposure is so important with native plants and a lot of our native plants are really tolerant of sun, <laughs> you know. Um, so sometimes the, the tricky part is actually finding things that will work well in the shade. But you do want to pay attention to this in your yard. So what areas um, are very exposed? You know, do you have a wall on the west side of your house where it's just getting blasted with sun in the afternoon? That's an area you'll want to pay attention to. You want to pick stuff that's really hardy and is going to be able to withstand th those temperatures. Um, and, uh, you know, so what, ex what areas are exposed on, on the west side, which tends to be really harsh. Um, on the east side is usually a greater uh, opportunity. Um, where's your north and south exposure? Just trying to orient yourself and kind of understand how the sun might be impacting your yard. Um, you'll want to think about things like irrigation. Is this something that's an option for you? Are you planning to incorporate irrigation? Um, if not, you know, what are your plans for establishing the plants and how are you going to get them started and make sure that they um, survive once you plant them. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just also thinking about views. Is there anything you want to, you do want to see or you don't want to see? Plants can really help with that. Um, and maybe it's also hearing. So if you, you know, plants can also provide a sound block. So if you, you're up against a street or something like that, 
um, think about the screen, the visual screen and the noise screen that you could provide. And then, you know, maybe there's some good things. Maybe there's things that you're like, I really like this about my yard or I've got a really great tree. Need that to make sure that we don't interfere with it. Um, just, you know, thinking about the positive things that you do want there and maybe, you know, as, along with the things that you might want to adjust or change later on. So that's kind of understanding your physical space. Um, and I've got a slide here now. If you guys want to chime in in the chat, I'm interested to hear, you know, what kind of plants, if you've got a yard that you're working on right now or a project you're working on right now, what kind of plants do you have um, in your yard right now? What are you working with? So if you're able to chime in in the chat, I'll kind of try and pay attention here and see if I can get, let's see. I'm gonna have to pull this up, yeah. Okay. So I've got a few, actually I've got a few native plants in my yard and I've taken clippings from them. Um, so I'll show what I've got with me tonight. So you'll see some um, uh, pet, or not penstemon, some um, globe mallow and uh, some brittle bush. So I'll show you guys those today. Um, but if anybody has anything else um, that they are working with in their space, chime in and we'll see where we are. Texas sage, yeah, that's a really common one. And it's really great. It is a really hardy plant and um, it can be really beautiful when it blooms. All right. Elephant food, okay, great. That's a succulent. It's not a native, but it is a succulent that does really well here. Ah, Chilean, okay. Chilean pepper trees. There's also Chilean mesquites and native mesquites. So we'll talk about those a little bit tonight. Um, pine trees. Oh, grandma grass, that's great. Mullenbergia grass, yeah, we'll cover some of those tonight. Yeah, making over those floody irrigated lots can kind of be a, a challenge. So we'll talk about some plants that might work well with that tonight too. All right, cool. And then I'm gonna save just some of these other questions um, when we get a little break and we'll, maybe Charlie can round them up for me and we'll, um, we'll try and address those too. Hopefully, I don't forget about them, let's see. Chuparosa, that's a great native plant. Queen's wreath, okay, cool. Wow, okay, Sarah, looks like you don't need me. <laughs> You've got a lot of stuff already. Cool, I like to see that too. If you, Sarah's got chuparosa, it looks like honeysuckle, um, hibiscus, queen's wreath, um, fruit trees. So that's a real mix and I like to see that too. You know, there's a mix of native plants and non-native plants and edible things. And, you know, I like to see uh, a good mix there too. Cool. All right, well, thank you guys for chiming in. We'll keep keep going with the presentation here. Let's see. All right, so some people have native plants already. Some are maybe uh, looking for some more. Let's see, all right. So, so once you've kind of assessed your space and you've got hopefully um, started a base plan, you've started thinking through those questions, started locating things in your yard, um, what I like to do next is start making a diagram. So this is something that's kind of somewhere between a final design plan and your basic site plan. So it doesn't have specific design elements in it yet, uh, but the goal is to kind of outline or identify major features in the yard, where you might want new um, plants or new features in the yard, um, it just kind of taking all the information that you've been collecting about your space and putting it on paper so that you can start to make design decisions. And so you'll see, so this is an example. This is from Brad Lancaster's book, Rainwater Har Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. This is the volume one version. Um, and you'll see, so this is not a necessarily a design plan. It's not a final design. But you can see he's put a lot of thought into what kinds of things are influencing his yard. So he's got where the sun 
um, exposures are and uh, what that looks like in his yard. He's got all the major features, so the outline of the house, the driveway. Uh, these look like utility lines to me here. Um, his little shed, the, the sidewalk. Uh, and then he's also started to kind of identify, hey, I I'd like to place a tree here. I'm going to place a basin here. I'm going to have a trellis here. And then the difference is, you know, at this stage, you just, it's, it's best not to get really tied into specific species yet, um, unless you have something very specific in mind. But if you can kind of generally say, hey, I would like a patio tree that's, you know, about 15 feet and it's going to provide me shade, uh, you know, in the morning or in the afternoon or something like that. That way you leave your options open to what is going to work uh, without getting, you know, bogged down too early with selecting specific species. And then, yeah, so here's just another example. This one's even a little bit more basic, uh, but uh, it just is, a, you know, just a, a diagram and a way to, you know, display the things that are in your yard. Some things, these like the accent plant, maybe that's existing already and you want to keep it. Um, or maybe you're just saying, hey, I want to put an accent plant here. I want something that's going to be big and attention getting. This is in the front yard. Uh, and so you can do those things now and just create, we call them also bubble diagrams. So you see like things are just drawn out in bubbles. Like I generally want a lawn here, maybe a pool here. And so it doesn't have to be too specific. That way you don't get, um, sometimes when you have bubbles, it can feel a little bit overwhelming because there's just so much you can do. Um, and so this is kind of helps you bite, you know, bite off little chunks to, to tackle, um, tackle things, you know, in smaller chunks. So, uh, and then this, this uh, diagram is uh, from a handout that, um, the, that AMWA puts out, it's the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association, and it's their zero scape landscaping with style um, booklet. So it helps you kind of walk through the design process as well. So that's a, also a really good resource. Okay. Oh, all right. So I thought I had this slide. Sorry, I skipped over this. But I'm, I'm interested now that we talked about this a little bit. Um, and we'll do that chat thing again. But I'd like to hear, you know, what are some of the goals that um, you guys do have for your yard? So I'm going to kind of go through some plants. Um, and I'd like to know, you know, are you looking at providing shade? Do you need shade in your yard? Are you interested in creating habitat? Um, you know, some of these features of how your landscape can, um, what you'd like it to look like. And that way, as I'm covering, um, as I'm covering the plants in the presentation, I can kind of pull those things out if you're interested in them. So let's see. Yeah, so yeah, if you have any goals or anything you're hoping to achieve from your landscape or the plants in your landscape and you want to um, add them in the chat, that'd be great. And we'll kind of talk about it a little bit or, you know, maybe you're just open for all ideas. Great, cool. Edible pollinators, screens, and shade. That sounds like what a lot of people will probably be interested in. Okay, cool. So blocking off the flood irrigation, maybe keeping some things that will work with it. Keeping some mature trees, so we can talk about that. Shade and color, great. Cool down a very sunny yard. Great, cool. Yeah, designing. Okay, so uh, Lynn is talking about accommodating plants that volunteer. So volunteers would be plants that come up from seed that volunteer to grow in your yard. Um, and uh, so that's something you can also address with your design as well. If you allow some flexibility in your design uh, and don't plant every single, you know, inch of the space. You can allow some of those things to um, work their way into your landscape as you as you move on. So, cool. So it looks like we've got some interest in shade and cooling down yards, some edible plants, shade and color. Cool. And so, okay, so it sounds like we've got some people that have some native 
landscaping that some of it's going to stay and we're going to try and work with that. So that's neat. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for, <laughs> for participating in the little chat, trying to, trying to break up these slides here a little bit too. So let's see. All right. Okay, cool. So we're going to get into the plants. Um, and when I talk about the plants, uh, I'm going to present some consistent information for each plant on the slides. And I just want to talk a little bit, you know, why I've decided to cover that information. And um, it kind of, this is the process that I like to use when I'm designing as well. So there's a lot of information that you can find when you're starting to research plants for your yard. Um, and these are probably not an exhaustive list of the traits you'll see, but it's, it's, these are very common things that you'll find. And, um, you know, it's actually kind of hard to, I think when you start looking for plants, you'll, sometimes you won't find the same information for each thing. So you might be able to find the watering requirements for something, but then another book or, you know, whatever you're looking at website doesn't have that information. So sometimes it's hard to find the same information so that you can compare, you know, apples to apples. Um, and so there's a few things that I think are kind of more important uh, to pull out and try and focus on if you can. So, uh, so when I present everything, obviously, I'll, I'll show you the scientific and common name. That's obviously an important one, but you, it's kind of goes without saying. And um, these are the other traits that I'm going to talk about. So uh, origin and or native habitat. So we get a little bit of buffer here because the plants I'm covering in the presentation are all native. Uh, so, but if you were, you know, looking at a list that wasn't native plants, uh, this is a really key thing to look at because this can tell you a lot of these other traits like sun exposure, soil, watering. Some of those things are wrapped up into the origin or native habitat of that plant. So say you know something is native to the Sonoran Desert, you know that you know uh, that it is uh, in a desert area, so it's used to desert soils, which may be low in nitrogen or whatever traits are associated with that. Um, if it's native to the Sonoran Desert, you know that it might be adapted to our um, kind of two season wet rainy season, so it might be used to getting rain in the monsoon season and then rain in the winter. Um, at least historically, see how long that's going to be the trend. I'm not sure after this year. Um, but anyway, so knowing that origin and the native habitat can really kind of key you in on where that plant is supposed to grow, what the conditions are like, where it grows, and you know if it will tolerate the conditions um, in your yard or the space that you're working with. Uh, and then, so another important one is the foliage form and characteristics. So this is the general form, what does the plant look like? How much space does it take um, Take up? Is it um, kind of create an umbrella type shape? Does it grow very upright? Um, this is basically just how it's going to present in the landscape when you plant it. Uh, and then size is also very important. So it's really important to look at the eventual size or full grown size of whatever plant you're selecting for your yard. Um, this is a really important one to research and know beforehand before you start planting because, you know, a lot, you, when you buy something in the nursery, you're buying it in a smaller container size. And uh, so it's not at its full grown size yet. And uh, you want to make sure that when you plant it, you've provided enough room for it because, you know, it can become a problem later on, even a hazard if you've planted something under a power line or, you know, anything like that. Or, you know, it can just create more work for you. If you've planted something next to a pathway and it's too big, and then you're always having to, you know, trim it or shear it. Um, and if you just you maybe selected something different or, you know, placed it a little further away, uh, then it could reduce all that maintenance for you. So definitely something to pay attention to. Uh, and then flowering and fruiting. So this is, um, I think, an important one because a lot of us are looking for plants that are adding color or um, interest to the yard. And this is how you'll know if it's doing that. Um, and then fruiting as well. I mean, if it's a, a native or edible plant, um, the fruiting can be often what you're harvesting. 
but also fruiting means seed pods and things like that. So if you have a pool or patio or something where you don't want seed pods falling, you know, making a mess, uh, this is something to pay attention to. And then um, I always try to kind of boil down and I'll present um, like a pro and con or, or some kind of characteristic that's kind of like the, the gist of the plant or something unique about it. Um, this helps me often to remember the plants as I'm, you know, learning them. And so hopefully it'll help, kind of help you as well. And um, I think it's just, you know, it just gives you like, this is what this is good for. This is a good application for that plant. So, so we'll look at um, those traits for the plants that I'm going to talk about tonight. Okay. All right. So we'll start with trees, <laughs> which um, is a big one to start with. Are you know what you're gonna mainly look for if you're trying to create shade in your yard. So I'm going to talk about kind of the big hitters. Um, and for each section, I'm not um, giving an exhaustive list of plants, obviously. And uh, so if there's something specific in the questions at the end, and you want to um, ask about them, you know, fire away. Um, but also, I'm going to give those additional resources at the end, so you can look up more things if you want to. So. So we'll do our best here. Um, so I'm gonna start with Blue Palo Verde, which is the state tree. Uh, the scientific name for Blue Palo Verde is Parkinsonia Florida. Uh, Blue Palo Verde has a actually pretty rounded habit to it. Um, usually when you see them from a distance, if they haven't been pruned um, very much, you'll see that um, it, the overall canopy creates a really rounded shape to it. Um, these are partially deciduous trees, so usually they will lose most of their leaves in the winter. So um, deciduous plants are those that lose all of their, lose their leaves at a certain time of the year. Um, it's usually related to winter and dormancy in winter. And so these will, you'll see them in the winter, they kind of tend to look a little bit raggedy and that's because they've lost a lot of their leaves, but they don't lose everything. Uh, this is one of our larger trees, so it will it can get to 30 foot height and width, can get bigger, but um, that's a pretty good average. Uh, these have really showy yellow flowers, so you guys are probably used to seeing these all over the valley, you know, in that springtime, um, March, April time frame, and, um, you know, they'll just cover the tree. So this can be something some people really love, especially if you love yellow. Um, sometimes people don't prefer the litter from uh, the flowers, so you might think about that if you've got a pool. Uh, and um, there's one more thing I was going to say about the flowers. I forgot. If I remember, I will say it. Um, the Blue Palo Verde is really great for all kinds of exposures. So if you have a yard that's just like baking in the sun, there's nothing out there yet, uh, Blue Palo Verde is a really great tree to put out there. It will be able to tolerate a lot of those harsh exposures um, really well and grow very quickly and um, be able to provide some shade pretty, pretty quickly for you in your yard. Um, so a distinct trait about the Blue Palo Verde, which relates to the name, is that it does kind of have a slight blue tint to it, um, the bark and the, um, the, the leaves just like the slightest blue tint. And you'll see that as the blue Palo Verde ages, uh, that bark, especially the trunk, will kind of uh, age and be less smooth and it will look more brown and kind of like traditional bark. So that's something kind of unique to the blue Palo Verde. Uh, but this is a fast growing, large canopy shade tree. Um, so it's great for creating shade in your yard, and it's also a really good uh, ha plant for creating habitat. All of the native trees are really um, important habitat species. They provide food, they provide places for nesting uh, and shade. So they're all the trees are um, really great for creating habitat. You definitely want to have, you know, something like that in your yard to do that. So um, something I like to cover because it can be really tricky is there are several, actually several different varieties and species of Palo Verdes. Uh, so I just like to try and cover what the differences are and how you can kind of tell them apart. 
And I think the easiest way is to look at the leaves because the leaves are usually really distinct. So you'll see um, kind of in the upper left here, this is a leaf of the Palo Verde, blue Palo Verde. And it tends to be really short and stubby, the leaves, you know, maybe a couple inches. And that's, that's pretty unique to the blue Palo Verde. Uh, the other, um, one of the other major native varieties is called Little Leaf um, or Foothills Palo Verde, Palo Verde um, which is on the bottom left here. And uh, I always call it Little Leaf Palo Verde because then it helps me remember what it looks like, right? So it's got these teeny tiny little leaves. I mean, they're just like, you know, less than an eighth of an inch. So, so that's how I remember that one. And that one's pretty easy. Uh, and then the two that are kind of difficult to tell apart are the Desert Museum Hybrid and the Mexican Palo Verde. They both have very, very long leaflets. So these are several inches, maybe like three or four inches long. Um, and, you know, less short and stubby than the Blue Palo Verde. Um, but if you look at these two, oh goodness, okay, we have some image quality. Sorry about that. Um, so. If you look at these two um, as a big tree, the Mexican Palo Verde tends to look like a weed. It won't make a nice um, tree-shaped habit, whereas the Desert Museum does create a, um, a nice tree shape. So I'm sorry about the image quality on this. There's some last minute changes and this one didn't come through. So, uh, but it will create much more of a habit like this, whereas the Mexican Palo Verde is a weed and it's something that you really don't want to have growing in your yard. Um, and then again, so these, this is the blue Palo Verde. There's also a, another variety of Palo Verde. This is the Palo Brea. This is actually not a native variety. It's a South American variety. And um, you'll see it sometimes, but it is really, really smooth. The bark is very, very smooth. And you'll see that the leaves grow really close to the branches. So you can kind of see it has these Medusa-like uh, branches coming out with the leaves really close to it. And, and that's a, you know, some kind of defining traits for that Palo Verde. All right, so let's talk about um, the Arizona or Velvet Mesquite. This is one of our native mesquite varieties. And um, you'll see these a lot more commonly in uh, landscape these days. Uh, the South American varieties uh, used to be very popular kind of in the 90s. And you'll see a lot of those around town, you know, especially in areas where buildings were built around that time. Um, and, uh, and there's definitely some differences between the two. So, the native mesquite uh, is Prosopis velutina. And again, it has a partially deciduous habit to it, so it will lose a lot of leaves in the winter. Uh, and this one has more of a sprawling habit to it than the blue Palo Verde, which was kind of rounded. This will kind of spread out a little bit and have more of an umbrella-like shape to it. Uh, these can get really big. So this is one where you really want to think about your um, irrigation and how much water is being provided to the tree because you can control that growth rate with um, reducing your irrigation. Uh, but they can get 20 to 50 foot high and, and uh, 50 to 25 foot wide. This is a little bit more upright in terms of mesquite trees. Um, so that's why you see the height like that. Uh, the, this does flower. So you actually see the picture I'm showing you does have flowers in it. Um, they're, they're kind of inconspicuous though. You're not, they're not really showy. They kind of look like a, a Cheeto puff, um, but just kind of like yellow instead of bright uh, neon orange. Uh, and you'll usually see these later, a little bit later um, in the spring. So, you know, around May timeframe. Uh, great. This is also really, really great for full sun exposure. So you can put it in the harshest conditions and it will do really well. Uh, one thing that it, it, mesquites are also really difficult to tell apart from each other. Uh, and this one, <clears throat> again, I think the leaves are um, something you can use to tell it apart. So it tends to have, again, kind of rounded leaflets. Um, whereas some mesquites have very long um, linear uh, leaves. So that's something to look for. But, you know, again, this is a really fast growing tree. It's going to provide you lots of shade and um, 
and is a great habitat plant. Uh, as well as this is a variety that's um, edible. So the seed pods um, are often collected. You can mill them and turn them into a flower. Uh, so there's a lot of great things about uh, the mesquite. There's also um, some different hybrid varieties that are grown by local nurseries. So if there's certain traits you're looking for with the mesquite, um, you might be able to find a hybrid variety that um, fits what you're looking for. So uh, this one on the left here, the um, Phoenix hybrid is sold by Mountain States Nursery and it's a thornless variety. So that's one of the reasons a lot of those South American mesquites were used is because they were thornless but they tend to have really weak wood. They grow really strange shapes and, and, and fall and lose branches a lot. So this you get to use a native variety, but you also get that thornless characteristic. Um, and then the other, there's another uh, variety sold by Arid Zone Trees, and this is a seedless variety. So if you're concerned about the pods making a mess and things like that, um, you can find a seedless variety. Oh, geez, all these. Okay, I'm so sorry about these last pictures that didn't come through here. <clears throat> um, so this is the desert willow. Let's um, see if I can. I'm going to find you guys a better picture here. Sorry, if you'll allow me to improvise a little bit, we'll get a good picture for you. Okay, so here's a great picture. <clears throat> so this is um, from Mountain States Wholesale Nursery. They are a, a local nursery. They're wholesale, but they supply a lot of the um, nurseries in town, the retail nurseries in town. And uh, so this is desert willow. So this is a native tree, but it's a little bit smaller. So if you're looking for something that's going to fit um, a smaller space, it's a really great patio tree. Uh, desert willow is definitely one to choose. Um, one thing about the desert willow is it is fully deciduous. So it will completely lose all of its leaves in the winter. Uh, so that's something to consider, but also it can be to your advantage because if you are trying to get some sunlight in the winter and bring in some warmth. Um, this is great because it won't, you know, it's not going to shade anything out in the winter. Um, so this might be a good one to put you know, something in a vegetable garden or something like that. That might be good because you'll get shade in the summer, but in the winter it will allow the sun to come through. The other really great thing about the desert willow are the flowers. I mean, that's the really showy part. Um, you'll see the, the pinkish um, purple flowers here. Uh, and they actually, the nurseries around town have been growing lots of different varieties. So a lot of them are selecting for flower color. So you can sometimes find them with the flowers that are like a deep burgundy color. Um, sometimes they're a little bit more kind of fuchsia like this. The native, true, true native ones tend to be a little bit lighter pink. Um, but they're really beautiful and these are really great um, habitat as habitat plants as well. Um, hummingbirds especially like them because they have that tubular shaped flower. So, you know, any of the plants that I cover tonight that have that tubular or trumpet shaped flower are going to be really great um, hummingbird plants. Uh, so yeah, desert willow is a great, great little tree to select and kind of nice because it's a little bit unique. Um, a little bit different from the mesquite and Palo Verde. All right, so we'll go back to my slides here. Okay, so some other trees that um, I don't have time to cover fully, but um, are great options uh, would be the Scrooby mesquite. This is another native variety. This one is sometimes hard to find in the nursery, but this the seed pods are really neat. They look like a little screw, um, corkscrew. Uh, desert ironwood is another fabulous tree. And uh, this one, the, the desert ironwood grows much more slowly, um, but is often more sturdy than the um, mesquite, especially. Um, little leaf palo verde is also great, but it's a smaller tree as well. So it's more like your desert willow. Uh, and the featherbush tree also 
uh, looks a lot like a mesquite, but is smaller um, variety. So it's also a really great patio tree. Okay, so we will move on to shrubs. And uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Chuparosa. So uh, this is uh, Justicia californica, it's a scientific name. It definitely has a overall loose kind of sprawling habit to it. You can see it kind of like trailing and you know bouncing up and down and all around here. This shrub can get quite large. So uh, the range is from two to six feet height and width. And this is really highly dependent on if you're providing it with permanent irrigation or not. So if you're irrigating it, it's going to be more in the six foot range. If you're not, it's going to be more in the two foot range. Um, it has these really beautiful um, salmon kind of colored flowers that are that tubular shape again. So this is a really great hummingbird plant. In fact, that's what it's named after. And um, it uh, also kind of has a really nice um, color to it, uh, when, especially when it's irrigated. So when it's irrigated, it tends to look um, kind of like this nice succulent green type of color. Uh, it will do, this is a nice one if you do have some shade in your yard, uh, because it will do well under, uh, under shady conditions. So if you have something you're trying to fit under existing trees, this would be a good one. And um, yeah, it, like I was mentioning, it can get much more lush, the more irrigation that it's provided, and it also get bigger. Uh, so that's something to consider. And then with this one too, I really try to make sure that it's not going to overgrow a walkway or something like that because it can be kind of brittle. Um, so if it's somewhere where people are walking by and brushing by it a lot, um, the branches tend to break a little bit. So it's just something to um, pay attention to and be aware of as you're you know, working on your design. Okay, and brittle bush. So I'm excited to share this one. Um, brittle bush, the scientific name is Encelia farinosa. Uh, it has a very rounded shape to it. So it's not like uh, it's not like the Chuparosa where it kind of sprawls and spreads out. It usually has a very rounded shape. Um, this is the one you're probably used to seeing, you know, like as you're driving, if you're driving down to Tucson on the side of the road and you see yellow, sea of yellow flowers everywhere, it's probably brittle bush. Uh, it tends to grow a little bit smaller than the Chuparosa, so three to five foot height and width. Again, that's irrigation dependent. Um, <clears throat> and it has these really great, beautiful yellow flowers. They're just sunny and bright and happy. Uh, and you'll start to see those. They're some of the first things to kind of start flowering in the spring and late winter. Um, so sometimes you'll start seeing them in January, February. Uh, the one, one wonderful thing about this is it is a fully sun bulletproof plant. So if you've got those harsh exposures on the western side or just, you know, a south facing yard that's really tough exposures, uh, this is a great one to, to select for that. So um, some of the distinct traits, especially if there's no flowers on it, the foliage is really unique. So you can also play with colors in that way. Uh, it has a really great silver color to it, and um, it actually has a kind of slightly fuzzy uh, texture to it. Uh, and the leaves are very triangular in shape, so that's something that's pretty distinct about the brittle bush. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite plants to use because it's just bulletproof. You can put it in your harsh exposures. And the really great thing is you can buy a very small plant and it's very um, fast growing. So it'll grow into a full size plant, you know, within one season. So um, if you're looking for something to kind of fill up a little bit of room in your yard and not spend a lot of money, brittle bushes are a really great choice. And let's see, so I'm gonna show you guys, I have some of this in my yard. So, um, so this is a branch that I cut off earlier today. But you'll see it's got a really great silver color to it. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, you can probably tell a little bit, but it's got that little bit of fuzziness to it. It's not like super soft, but you can kind of tell it's a little bit matte. Um, and then let's see, yeah, you can see that the leaves are like really triangular. So that's kind of unique. They're very broad and triangular. So that's something that you can help you tell it apart um, if you're looking for it out in the landscape. 
Alrighty. It's one of my favorites, so I hope you guys will try it out. All right. Okay. So I have to cover creosote. Um, the scientific name of creosote is Laria tridentata. Um, most of you are probably pretty familiar with creosote. Um, at least if you're not sure what it looks like, you've probably smelled it before. Uh, that's one of the things it's really known for is that desert rain smell is probably coming from a creosote. So if you actually go by them and crush the leaves like between your fingers, you can get that, that scent. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a large shrub. It has a, tends to have a very irregular habit to it. You saw those ones at the beginning of the slideshow. They kind of just go all over. Uh, and the density really varies depending on the irrigation like I was showing. Uh, they can get quite large. So um, yeah, they can get up to eight feet. It really depends on how old the plant is and how much water it's getting. I would say, you know, in a, a landscape, you're probably somewhere more in the five foot range, um, five or six feet. The, the eight foot tends to be when they're very old established um, plants. Uh, it does have uh, yellow flowers and um, you'll kind of see them, but they're not really showy the way uh, Palo Verde is showy. Um, so you'll kind of see them pop up here and um, it creates these little fuzzy seed pods. Uh, so if you see either one of those things on the plant, that might help you identify it as a creosote. Uh, these really need a full sun exposure, so they're not gonna do well if you've got shade and you're trying to put them under something you know, existing or they're gonna get shaded out. Um, you know, don't want them necessarily on the north side of your house. Uh, but they will do really great in those really tough exposures. And uh, if you're working on a uh, water harvesting design, these are really great, I think, for basins, especially if you're trying to design a landscape that is not going to use um, permanent irrigation. Uh, these can be really great because they'll do well uh, you know, in your basins on the sides without permanent irrigation provided to them. Uh, the, the one thing that you know, some people experience with creosote is it can kind of be tricky to establish when, when planting, um, but uh, just make sure that when you plant them, they're watered in fully and they're really getting enough water to establish them. Um, and and uh, you should have pretty good success. Um, all right, so that is creosote. So some more shrubs, um, and this is a really big category, but some more that um, I like to use that are native would be the triangle leaf bursage. This is a really um, important restoration plant. You'll often find it in native habitat with creosote. Um, it looks really similar to brittle bush, but is much smaller. Um, the only thing is it does have um, little like kind of bursage seed pods. So uh, if you have maybe kids or dogs that are gonna kind of run through stuff, um, it may not be one you really would prefer. Um, hot bush is another great uh, large shrub. And this one um, actually kind of has a habit that's really similar to oleander. So if you're looking for something that is gonna provide a screen, you know, either visually or for a sound barrier, or you wanna use something other than oleander, uh, hot bush is a really great choice. They'll grow pretty quickly um, and get just about as big as, as um, an oleander. They just don't flower, but uh, they don't flower in the same way oleanders do. Uh, the fairy duster is a really great choice and also a really great um, habitat plant uh, for, I've seen all kinds of um, uh, bugs and insects and birds. Um, in the fairy duster. The hummingbirds love it, butterflies love it, uh, so it's a really great choice. Um, the desert hackberry is also a large shrub, can be a little bit irregular in shape, but uh, it creates a um, fruit that is really um, uh, palatable to birds, so they love to eat the fruit from it. And um, it is a thorn uh, shrub, so I've seen a lot of birds nest in this because it kind of creates a nice secure um, habitat for them. So, so that's an option too. Um, the turpentine bush, which I'll show you, is not necessarily the most beautiful shrub. Um, it's kind of nondescript, but it's a really great uh, um, uh, shrub for um, bugs and insects, right? So those are those important 
um, piece of the food chain, right? So this is a picture of the turpentine bush kind of up close. And this is it in flower. And you'll just see it's just covered with bugs. I mean, there's bees, there's little butterfly or little moths, um, some insects, just all kinds of stuff just covering this thing. So, you know, think about plants that you might not necessarily um, think of right off the bat for their looks, but also fill a really important role as far as habitat goes. Uh, and, you know, going somewhere like the Desert Botanical Garden or when you're out hiking, um, trying to look and see what plants and, you know, bugs and insects and animals are attracted to and then, um, you know, using those in your yard. All right, so I'll move on to accents and grasses. So accents will include like our cacti and things like that. Oh, goodness gracious, all these pictures I used did the same thing, okay. So I'm gonna talk about desert milkweed. And um, if you are familiar with milkweed at all, uh, you probably know that uh, milkweed is really important host plant for monarch butterflies. Uh, and so we're a little bit challenged uh, here in finding milkweed varieties that do well in the desert. <laughs> and so desert milkweed is one of those varieties. And this one does, does do quite well in the Phoenix area. Uh, it has a kind of unique shape and look and habit to it uh, with these pencil-like stems. Uh, they are really kind of a, a grayish green color. So it's got a nice, um, you know, different color to it and texture to it if you want to play with it um, in the yard. You know, with other, um, you know, contrasting it with something that's really bright green can create some really unique visuals. Um, but otherwise, it's not that interesting. So the flowers aren't, this one is um, in full flower and you'll see, but they're kind of inconspicuous, not really super showy. Um, but, you know, that's really not what it's for. If you're, if you're playing this, so you're probably really serious about providing some uh, habitat for monarch butterflies. Uh, this one can actually get quite tall. I've seen them, you know, get up to four or five feet. Uh, but usually they're going to stay around the three foot height range and maybe probably three foot width range. Uh, let's try to think anything else. Uh, let's see. Yeah, but the, the really great thing about this one is you're providing that native habitat for the monarch butterflies. Um, and then I would also be really careful to make sure that you plant this one in full sun. Uh, I've planted this before and, and in places where it gets um, shade, you know, even if it's kind of partial shade throughout the day, uh, it gets very droopy. So it doesn't stand upright the same way. Um, and uh, the stems kind of elongate in a way that's not as attractive. So this one really, really needs to be in full sun. So if you, again, have those really tough exposures, this is a really great choice for those um, situations. Okay. All right, so Perry's agave. This is a native agave. Um, the scientific name is agave perii. It has a very upright, you know, sturdy form to it, like all agaves kind of have that pineapple um, shape to them. This is a smaller agave, so three foot by three foot is really kind of the max range for it, and that really doesn't happen until it's a much older established plant. Uh, the flowers do, um, it does create a very large, tall flower stalk. Um, but the thing about agaves is that they only flower once within their lifetime. And once they flower, um, they'll, they'll die. At least the original plant will die. So it's not something you're really, you know, planting an agave for the flower stalk, because once you see it, it kind of means the end is near. Um, but often um, agaves will uh, either send up um, smaller uh, offshoots from the roots. Uh, and then some varieties actually create, um, instead of seeds, they actually create baby plants on the flower stalk uh, that plant themselves. And call, some people call them pups. Um, so usually it dies, but you're going to get some reproduction out of it. Uh, this one, uh, sorry, let's see, uh, Paris agave 
is also a good one if you've got some shady conditions. So if you've got something where, you know, you've got some existing trees and you want to put something underneath it, uh, Perry's agave will tolerate um, some shade, but it'll also do pretty well in full sun. Uh, this is one of those more gray green type agaves. And um, you'll notice that it definitely has, so this says thorny margins. So margins refers to the edge of the leaves. So you'll see, you know, there's thorns all the way along the edge of each leaf. And it also has a pretty um, serious uh, uh, thorn at the tip of the leaves. So, you know, just something to be aware of if that's something that's a concern for you. But it, those thorns are what create those really cool patterns that you see on the agave leaves. So you can kind of barely make it out, um, you know, here a little bit, but, you know, looking for agaves that have those um, big thorn patterns, you'll get those cool textures as the leaves unfold. Uh, so this is just, it's just a really hardy native agave that will um, be a great addition to your yard. It's just, it's not too fussy. Um, and so that's kind of important to know. I like to kind of point this out about agaves because they can be very difficult to tell apart, uh, but there are a lot of, of agaves that are not native to Arizona. And so they actually struggle in the summer and sometimes in the winter too. And um, so it's important to kind of, this is where knowing that native habitat or origin really comes into play. Um, because if you know if something is native to maybe like the Baja Peninsula or kind of like San Diego area where it's humid and kind of more mild temperatures, then you know that it might struggle here because we are so dry. And not only that, we're hot in the summer and we actually freeze in the winter. So, so those are some things to kind of key in on. Um, and you'll see this sign, this is from the Desert Botanical Garden, but even they point out not all agaves you know, can just handle the full sun that we have here and the heat that we have here. So um, agave attenuata is an example of one. This is kind of more of a tropical type agave. Uh, it does really great in California, but it doesn't do well here unless you've got a very specific microclimate where it's not going to get frozen in the winter. Um, Queen Victoria's agave is, again, it's not a native variety, but it's um, kind of more native to kind of the um, mountainous kind of northern Mexico um, region. So uh, even though it's not native because of its elevation where it's found natively, um, it does well here because it doesn't freeze in the winter uh, and it can kind of tolerate that extra heat too. So it's just something to, I like to point out in, in um, with a lot of these plants, it's really easy to find the variety you're looking for, but agaves can be kind of tricky. So I just like to make sure, you know, when you're selecting agaves, make sure you know what variety you're looking for and um, make sure you get that right variety when you pick it out at the nursery. Okay, so Engelmann's prickly pear. So this one I like to cover the um, uh, scientific name is Apuntia Engelmanii. Uh, this is a native prickly pear and one that creates fruit profusely. So if you're looking for um, something that you can harvest, a native um, edible plant, this is a great option. You do really need a ton of space to have this one in your yard. So if you are trying to put it in a small space, um, it, it's going to probably be a challenge for you because you're going to be trying to prune it and, and beat it back um, pretty frequently. So make sure you've got you know, enough room for this thing to go. Um, it won't kind of tend to get over six feet in height, but it will spread out and cover a large area. Flowers are really pretty. They can be these kind of orangish yellow pink shades, kind of depends on the plant and the variety you get. Uh, and uh, will do great in a full sun exposure. So do really well in a harsh exposure and it will do okay in kind of some light shade. Um, but you know, some of the distinct traits that you might use to tell this prickly pear apart from the others, um, the pads have a real teardrop shape to them, so they'll be more narrow um, at the end than they are at the top. Uh, and they also have uh, spines, so you'll see the spines here, and they also have what are called glockids. So glockids are these little um, fiber-like needles feel kind of like fiberglass and a lot of times these it's worse to have the glockids in your finger than it is to have the actual thorns so 
just make sure that you are handling these with care if you are you know, going to harvest or um, you know, work with these plants. Uh, but the really, you know, great thing about this is it creates um, that fruit that you can harvest for prickly pear, um, just to eat the fruit or, you know, jams and jellies and all those kinds of things. Uh, so deer grass, Mullenbergia origins, uh, this is a large bunch grass. Uh, and so I like to cover the grasses um, in this presentation too, because they work really well with our, we're kind of filling a niche if you're doing a water harvesting landscape. And uh, so a lot of times we don't like to put, well, it's really inadvisable to put cacti and succulents in the bottom of a water harvesting basin because uh, they don't like to tolerate water standing against their leaves. But something like a grass will do really great in that condition. So I present the grasses just to make sure that you know, you're, look, you're considering those as you're designing your basins and something that can you know, withstand having um, water touching the leaves for extended periods of time. Deer grass is a little bit larger of one, and I'm going to show you a little bit smaller one. But so this one will kind of grow in the three to five foot range, again, depending on irrigation. Um, it does have flower spikes. They're, they're pretty inconspicuous. They kind of have like a tan color to them, um, it, but they're not too showy in this variety. Uh, this one, again, is something that will do really well in the full sun. It'll do just fine and it will tolerate some shade. So if you need something in the shade, this is another great choice. But it's just a really versatile, um, great grass to use if you're, you know, designing something with a basin and you need something that's going to tolerate the water. Um, also, grasses in general are really good if you're, um, you know, trying to stabilize some slopes in your basin. So around rock work and things like that, the roots are really fibrous so they can help hold soil in place. <clears throat> okay, and then blue grandma is a, a little bit smaller variety. So if a Mullenbergia is too big for you, then the um, blue grandma is another option. It's a little bit more petite, probably like two foot range. Um, the flower stalks are and seed heads are a little bit more interesting. They have like a curved shape to them. Let's see, yes, I have a little close up picture. So they can be kind of pretty, especially if light is shining through them. And, um, but this one does do a little bit better with a full sun exposure. And it, it also has a little bit higher water requirement um, than some of the other grasses. But this is a really great one for, you know, again, putting the bottom of your basin, helping prevent erosion, uh, especially if you have something that needs to fit in a tight space. Uh, so there's tons of accents and cacti that can be used. I didn't cover a lot of them, but you know, the saguaro is also something you can put in your yard and, um, you know, definitely an investment time-wise, but um, yeah, really iconic, right? Uh, Engelman's hedgehog cactus is a really great option if you want something with a really showy flower to it and great color. Um, Oregon pipe cactus, I'd like to use this uh, too as kind of an alternative to saguaro. It, it has that same vertical element to it. Uh, but it takes up a little bit more space, um, similar to Ocotillo, you know, kind of has that nice vertical habit to it, um, beautiful flowers, but, um, you know, not quite as expensive as a um, Saguaro. Okay, so um, I'll just jump into the annuals and perennials and um, Kind of talk it to you too. Um, so, what about what I mean by annuals and perennials? So, an annual is a plant that um, completes its entire life cycle in one growing season, which means it goes to seed, it flowers, grows, flowers, goes to seed, and then um, kind of dies and withers away a little bit. Uh, and uh, so, the ones I'm going to show you have that annual, you know, kind of are technically annuals but often act more like perennials. So if the conditions are right, they'll kind of persist and continue to grow throughout the year. And that, that's the case here with the globe mallow, which is uh, Spheralsia ambigua. It kind of ends up looking like a, a large shrub, but it has a very irregular habit to it. It's not rounded, it kind of sprawls and, and does its own thing. Um, and uh, this will stay kind of probably, you know, in the two to four foot range. Um, and that's pretty consistent. Uh, the native variety, what you'll see, like if you're hiking, uh, is orange. The flowers are this kind of 
Um, this is really characteristic of that, so that orange color. But if you buy them from a nursery, they come in a huge range of colors. So, you know, I've seen everything from pink and white and lavender um, to burgundy. So it really, you can get a lot of variety. And that's one of the things I really love about this plant. It is really good full sun exposure. And I would hesitate to plant this in the shade because it, the leaves elongate and they look kind of um, rangy a little bit. Uh, but the distinct trait are these very paper-like um, flowers. They look really similar to hollyhock. It's the same family. So it's very similar if you're familiar with that. Okay. And then Perry's penstemon. So Perry's um, penstemon and some of the other penstemons tend to be much more like a traditional annual. They don't usually survive as long. So once they flower, they'll usually die for the season, um, but they will reseed easily. So if you let them create seeds and wait to prune them back until after they've seeded, uh, then you'll see them come back the next year. They kind of, um, it creates this kind of like herbaceous rosette. So it'll be kind of like a small clump and then you'll have huge stalks that come out from that. Um, and it's very herbaceous. So it looks kind of succulent like if you can see in this picture, the leaves, you know, kind of have that succulent like characteristic to them. Uh, the flower stalks themselves can get quite tall. So they can get three to four feet um, tall and you'll get these beautiful large, um, you know, magenta flowers from it. And again, these are really great for hummingbirds and all kinds of, you know, butterflies and things like that. Enjoy these flowers too. Uh, this one will do, do well in a full sun exposure and also tolerate shade. So it's something that, you know, especially if it gets a little shade in the afternoon is really advantageous. Uh, but the really distinct thing are these flowers. They're very unique. Um, this magenta tubular shaped flowers um, and uh, this one you'll see again like reseed throughout the throughout the years. All right, desert marigold. This might be one of my favorite little um, uh, shrubs here, perennials. Uh, the, the scientific name is Balea multiradiata. Uh, again, it creates this little clumpy and rosette and then the flower stalks kind of shoot up out from that. This one's very petite. So it's you know, max kind of two feet, maybe two feet um, height and width. They can spread out a little bit, especially if they continue to grow season over season. Um, it creates these really beautiful yellow flowers and they just kind of look like they're dancing because you don't see the flower stalks um, very prevalently. This is a full sun plant, so make sure it's got full sun exposure. And um, the really unique uh, Sorry, let's see. So the, the foliage again is that silver gray kind of color. Uh, and this one is, is again, it's kind of like more like the globe mallow. So it'll usually, you know, it'll have a period of kind of dying back a little bit in the summer, but it won't usually completely die back. Um, and this thing too, it'll flower like all throughout the year. So as long as there's rain or moisture, um, it'll usually be sending up flowers. Um, and this one, I, I love to show this picture. This is at the entry of the Desert Botanical Garden. Uh, and so this is, you know, how you can think about those annual perennial plants. So in the, the spring, when they're flowering, it fills in all this area, right? And then when they die back a little bit, they still have all these um, cacti that fill in the landscape. So when you're using annuals, one way to think about it is you know, plan on them not being as prevalent at a certain time of the year, and then um, how your yard might look when they're gone. Um, and so plan for it, you know, with them there and plan for it without them there. Um, and then just some more, you know, annuals and perennials that work really well, the paper flower, there's a ton of varieties of penstemon to look into. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of options um, for annuals. All right, so I'll wrap it up. Sorry, <laughs> I'm taking a little bit of a long time. Where can you learn more? So um, there's some resources here. Um, the Virtual Library of Phoenix Landscape Plants is run by a horticulture uh, professor at ASU. And this is where I get a lot of my information. Um, he's a really great resource. And I can kind of leave this slide up when we're done here and that maybe you guys can kind of, you know, circle back to it. Um, you're going to find the best selection of native plants from our local nurseries. So 
I, I've seen more and more native plants at, you know, kind of the bigger box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot, but um, really the better selection you're going to find at your local retail nurseries. And if you work with a local contractor, you'll be able to access, you know, wholesale um, varieties as well. So there's a lot of options and we have a lot of great native plant nurseries here in Arizona. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys so much. You can always follow up with me if you have questions. Um, my name or my email and phone number is there. Um, so feel free to reach out if there's something I, I can't get to tonight. Um, and, um, and then otherwise I'll try and uh, answer some questions, Charlie, if you've been able to um, look at them or if people want to chime in um, and ask a question now. Yeah, thank you, Kaylee, for the presentation. Um, we are gonna open up for questions. I was able to get a few questions or kind of skim and grab a few questions from the comments in the chat throughout the class, but uh, definitely feel free to, to add some more comments to the chat. Uh, and just a quick answer, yes, we'll be sending out this presentation. You'll get a, a, a follow-up email and this presentation will be included in that. Um, so some questions that came up one was Texas sage, uh, I thought you should prune that way back once per year. So I guess how often should you prune back Texas sage? Yeah, so that is a really common practice. It's not an absolutely necessary practice. So um, I was kind of trying to mention that a little bit. So it's not horticulturally necessary. Uh, and um, it's something that you can do, especially if you've got a plant that has been pruned and sheared a lot, you can prune it back um, to maybe like six inches above the soil to really refresh it. Um, but that's not something you necessarily have to do each year. And um, it's one of those uh, plants that you can, you can also just kind of let it go. So if it's something that you want to do, you feel like the plant's getting a little raggedy or maybe it's you know, kind of growing a little bit beyond what you have the space for, you can definitely do that. Um, but it's not absolutely horticulturally necessary. Cool. And someone made a comment about uh, having cleanup under, or having kind of tree litter under your tree canopy can be a source of fire. Or, you know, is there any reason to be worried about that? Or do you have any comments about that? Sure. So, you know, I really work in a more urban context. So that is um, not something that is necessarily my area of expertise and not something we necessarily deal with um, in the same way, you know, in the Phoenix urban area or the more urban areas of Phoenix. Um, and so I, there are a lot of great resources. Um, Firewise, I think, uh, has a lot of recommendations about how to maintain your landscape. Um, to reduce fire risk. So if that's something that you are concerned about, or maybe you're kind of like, you know, some people may be in the more rural areas of Maricopa County, um, I would definitely refer to those resources um, and follow those practices that are, you know, going to create a more safe landscape for you in your context. Great. And someone's looking for advice. What would you plant under mature palm trees next to a pool? Oh, next to a pool. Okay, so some things to consider, you know, next to a pool um, are, again, that, you know, kind of water, uh, <laughs> excess water, <laughs> that's going to be part of the equation. Um, and so, you know, things like those grasses that I was showing, those accents would do really well. And those are things that would tolerate a little bit of shade from the palm tree. It's not going to be a ton of shade, probably. Um, so thinking about things that are going to tolerate extra water. So I would stay away from cacti and agaves and things like that that might not be might not like being soaking wet. Um, the other thing you might consider also is litter. So how much litter is being created by the plants, and you know if that's kind of something where you're cleaning the pool out, you know, more often than you really want to be. Um, so uh, some things you know that would are not gonna flower as much necessarily or are not gonna create um, seed pods and fruit, excess seed pods and fruiting. Um, turpentine bush might be a great example of uh, something like that. 
um, where the flowers and, and seed pods aren't really conspicuous and not going to, you know, create a big mess for your pool. Great. So those were some of the, okay, we have, what are some vines that could be used for screening and are non-deciduous? Yeah, so um, something that comes to mind is, um, and it, the, the scientific name might have changed recently, but um, I remember as uh, Muscagnia macroptera, um, and it is, um, I'm blanking on the common name, but I will Google it and we will get it to you. But um, it is a um, native vine that it um, has yellow flower to it. So kind of flower is kind of similar to um, that uh, cat claw vine, if you're, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it is, does not grow the same way cat claw vine does where it kind of like overwhelms fences and knocks them over. Um, and uh, it has a really pretty seed pod to it too. So once it flowers and creates a seed pod, it's really pretty. Um, let's see if I can. Yeah, I just searched it. Is it the yellow butterfly vine? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah Miss Gagnam across the yellow butterfly vine. Yep. Cool. And Someone's growing queens and wreath on the, the east side of their house. They're seeing it's good at providing shade. Is there any reason to prune that vine? Um, you know, sometimes that vine can have issues with frost. So if that's something you experience, you can, you can prune out some of that um, dead growth if we have a little heavier or really cold frost um, or freeze. And um, the key is to kind of wait until we get to February, like middle of February is usually when we have our last average frost. You want to wait, you know, until that point to prune that stuff out because uh, if we get another frost, you don't want to have pruned it back and then it, we get another one and then you keep, you know, having to prune it back. So wait till we're all done with frost and then do your pruning um, in the, you know, kind of mid-February range. But other than, you know, if it's, uh, it can be kind of vigorous. So if it's something where, you know, this, the size is out of control, um, you can definitely prune it, but um, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, advantage to pruning it back and getting it, you know, regrowing. So, yeah. Cool. We don't have any other questions. I'll take this time just to plug one more time. We do have the upcoming hydrate classes. Um, they're every Wednesday this month of September. I believe Hydrate Your Garden is the next class or Hydrate Your Veggies and it's 5.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. Also there's the field studies classes that you'll see on our website. We have a gray water, how to install gray water to a laundry to landscape system and also one about soils. Mm. I think if there's no other questions, we'll wrap it up. Great. Okay. Thank you. Kaylee, do you have any other, anything to add? No, no, that, no, that's about it. Thank you guys so much for hanging in there with me and covering <laughs> all the plants and hopefully you learned something and, you know, and hopefully um, really check out those resources too, because I use them all the time. I go back to them. So I know they'll be useful for you guys too. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks guys, good night. Good night.